I'm going to talk about debt today. Uh, this is a quote here from Benjamin Franklin. Uh, for those of you who don't know who old Benji is, he basically adorns the $100 bill in the US, which at today's exchange rate is sort of one and a half thousand rand. But basically, he said the second vice is lying, the first is running into debt. So as, as an equity manager, we've seen a considerable buildup of debt in companies, uh, and that has serious implications for, for equity investors, uh, and that's effectively what we'll uh, try and unpack today. To set the scene, this is just global debt levels. I think David showed you emerging markets in South Africa, so this is an amalgamation of, of global debt levels. Um, I've put in here the global financial crisis in 2008, uh, because essentially debt, a uh, buildup of debt in the developed market system was one of the main reasons for the global financial crisis. Uh, the alarming point is that if you added up these four components today, there is more debt in the system today uh, than there was prior to the glo global financial crisis. What we have seen, though, is thankfully a deleveraging of the financial sector. So those are effectively banks uh, as well as households. The households largely driven by uh, indebted developed market consumers that have... Uh, that have delevered, but we've seen a significant buildup in the red line, non-financial corporates, so industrial companies, etc., uh, and then governments. Governments have been spending um, very fast over, uh, post the global financial crisis to try and support uh, their economies. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll unpack for this now. I'll unpack this for us now. Uh, how we've moved from a 55% debt to GDP at a government level uh, to nearly 100%. Uh, so this chart is uh, the starting point, mid-2008, just before the collapse of Lehman Brothers, uh, debt to GDP for uh, various countries. Uh, South Africa highlighted here in red actually starts from a very strong position, uh, net to GDP of only 28%. Uh, at that point, our emerging market peers were sitting at around 35 uh, and the global average uh, around 55 Okay, fast forward 10 years, what you've effectively seen is a 50% increase in debt to GDP levels across the globe. Uh, unfortunately for South Africa, uh, driven largely by the spent thrift uh, sort of uh, Zuma years, uh, we've effectively doubled our debt to GDP. Uh, our debt to GDP metrics have deteriorated to such an extent that S&P downgraded our debt to junk uh, in uh, late 2017, and it's really only Moody's uh, which effectively has us uh, as investment grade, and that could also well change uh, in the next 12 months. Other than the stock of debt that we're carrying, uh, what is important is what is the the cost of your debt. Uh, and this is a particular problem for South Africa because interest rates today are very similar to what they were in 2008. So the fact that we've doubled our debt to GDP means we're now spending uh, double the amount on servicing our interest bill. So in 2008, 2.5% of our GDP went to, to uh, pay off our interest. That has now risen to 5%. That's actually not the case for the developed market world because there, given quantitative easing, they've been able to actually hold interest rates down. So the U.S. today is actually paying less away for its debt pile than it was in 2008, because long-term interest rates there have effectively gone from 4 to 2.5%. So obviously the big risk going forward is that interest rates were, to, if they were to rise, that would hamper gov government's ability, particularly in South Africa, to spend on uh, uh, fiscal uh, injections. Uh, a third overlooked metric, so the first metric is how much debt are you holding, the second metric is what is the cost of the debt, uh, and the third metric often overlooked is when is your debt actually due and payable. Uh, and thankfully, South Africa actually scores very well on this metric. Uh, the numbers here in the mustard blocks are the average term of maturity of your debt. South Africa actually scores uh, the second best here after the UK. Our debt on average is only due uh, 13 years uh, from now. Simplistically, you can think that South Africa has a very long road uh, you know, through which they can sort of kick the can down the road. Uh, this does buy us sort of quite a lot of time. This is effectively what we plot. This is South Africa's total debt maturity schedule from 2019 through to 2049. Uh, and on average, the debt would be repayable in, in 13 years. Um, if you just align yourself here on the horizontal axis, by 2025, we need to either repay or refinance 30% of our debt. Okay, compare that with the U.S., but at the same time, they need to sort of refinance almost three-quarters of, of their debt. So we have a much better debt maturity profile. It's obviously unlikely that the debt markets would close to the U.S., uh, but if a small open economy like ourselves or Greece or Namibia had a debt repayment schedule like this, uh, you would effectively run into some kind of refinancing problem, which is effectively what happened to Greece uh, in 2010 and, and 2011. 
okay, why do, why do we worry about debt? So you know, I guess as, as, as a team, we've been worrying about debt for at least the last 18 months. Uh, and that's effectively because all crises have involved debt uh, in one fashion or another, uh, where that debt effectively comes um, dangerously out of scale uh, with the underlying means of payment. Uh, and these are sort of some debt-induced crises that we've effectively have, have seen over the last decade or so. What do I mean by the underlying means of payment? If, if you're talking about an individual, so the U.S. housing crisis, your underlying means of payment is disposable income. So the issue there, I guess, was people took on too much debt relative to their after-tax earnings. Uh, if you're a country, the underlying means of payment is tax receipts, or at least tax receipts after government expenditure. Uh, and then for a corporate, effectively, it's your free cash flow. Um, free cash flow effectively is what level of your earnings that you're declaring to shareholders is actually a cash number that you can either use to pay dividends or effectively uh, pay down your debt. Uh, and we'll return to that a bit later in the presentation. Maybe just a couple of words on ESCOM. We have sort of uh, previously sort of spoken and written about this particular entity. Uh, its debt pile now currently sits at about 420 uh, billion rand. Uh, just to put that into context, if government you know, took that onto its own balance sheet, that would lift South Africa's debt to GDP metrics by sort of 2 to 3%. Uh, and almost certainly make the rating agencies again review our, our ratings. So this, this, this particular entity, given its, given its debt, precarious debt position, effectively is the sort of biggest single risk to the South African economy and the, the fiscus, and that's outside of obviously the impact uh, that their blackouts had on GDP uh, in, in the first quarter. Okay, what happens when... Oh, I thought, yeah, I thought we maybe just... Um, Stop here for a second just to try to explain leverage in a bit more detail um, uh, so that we can sort of compare different companies and, and different sectors. So I've just used a, uh, a very simple example of a house. Uh, the one house is quite expensive, 10 million. Uh, the individual who buys that house goes to the bank for a loan of 9 million. So we effectively argue that this house is 90% is levered. Uh, and on this particular house, uh, only a million rand of debt backing uh, a 2 million asset. Uh, so effectively, that is 50% uh, levered. Uh, interestingly, the, both houses have the same level of equity. Uh, and it's important when you're thinking as an equity investor, what is listed on the JSC is not the asset of the companies. It's actually the equity. So often we get asked, you know, why did so many companies fall by sort of 40% last year? I think last year we had more companies falling by 30 35% than we had at any other point other than in the global financial crisis. And unfortunately, leverage was one of the main reasons. A lot of our companies entered 2018 quite levered. Uh, and what I'm going to show you now is the impact of leverage on asset and equity levels. So let's assume we have a 10% decline in the value of an asset. Okay, so your house is no longer worth 10 million. It's now worth 9 million. What happens to the equity? Well, effectively, in this house, you lose 100% of your equity because you were effectively overly leveraged. In the more conservatively leveraged house, you lost effectively at tw only 20%. Uh, and effectively, that's what we saw last year. Yes, equities might have fallen 40%. That doesn't mean that the intrinsic value of the assets of a particular company reduced by 40%. The intrinsic value could have reduced by 15%, but given the leverage, the impact on the equity was at a 40% at a level. This obviously works in reverse. If things were to improve in South Africa and revenue or asset levels were to rise, the more levered companies would actually do better than the, the uh, less levered ones. Yeah, just to bear in mind, uh, ESCOM at the moment is sort of 75% levered on this kind of basis, just to give you a feel for how levered ESCOM is. Uh, they could effectively only stomach a 20% decline in their revenue or assets before effectively they, they lost all their equity. Okay, what happens when you take on too much debt? So this is an example uh, of Edgar's. Uh, some of you may recall Edgar's was listed uh, in South Africa prior to 2007. Uh, at, the, at the time, a very successful uh, clothing retailer. Didn't really require much debt. Uh, and then along came Bain, a private equity group in 2007, uh, and decided they wanted, to buy 20, they, they wanted to buy out Edgar's for 26 billion rand. Uh, and most ordinary shareholders were happy to uh, effectively sell them uh, this asset. Uh, the issue was that uh, Bain effectively just levered up the business. Um, they bought the business for 26 billion rand, but then injected almost 20 billion rand of debt back into the company. So all the debt that, they, that Bain took on, actually they just pumped down into the company, uh, such that the business was very highly levered uh, at sort of almost 80% uh, net debt to, to capital. 
Uh, obviously, we then hit the global financial crisis. Uh, South African retailers didn't do as, as well, uh, and this, this, this debt then built up to 100%. Okay, what happens when your debt to capital, capital reaches 100%? Well, your equity is effectively worthless, and you hand over the keys either to the bankers or to the debt holders. That's effectively what happened in uh, Edgar's case. So the reduction that you see here uh, from 2013 to 2014 is not the company paying back its debt, debt, but effectively the first set of equity holders being totally wiped out uh, and a certain uh, a number of the debt holders converting their debt to equity and becoming the new equity holders. Uh, this has happened twice in it, 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 it gives us uh, uh, history. So again, this debt reduction here is again the second set of equity holders being totally wiped out and another set of bond holders effectively becoming the equity holders. Uh, so as an equity investor, you obviously worry about leverage because if it gets too high, you effectively are either funding a rights issue for the company or effectively that company will go into business rescue and the banks will effectively take control. How levered are companies at the moment? Uh, this is the S&P 500, um, X financials. Uh, the banks took quite on quite a lot of leverage into the global financial crisis, so it, it distorts the analysis. So I've stripped the banks out here. Uh, but the general trend is as follows. Effectively, a buildup of debt into the global financial crisis. People then didn't like debt, so almost forced the companies to delever. And then we had a period from sort of late 2009 to 2015 when U.S. interest rates were effectively held at very low levels. Uh, that encouraged companies to take on more risk, uh, and they borrowed either to fund CapEx, share buybacks, or acquisitions. Uh, and it, you can see the leverage has basically begun to, again, build up in the system. Uh, we're now above GFC levels, although below the peak in, in 03. Okay, how does South Africa compare? Similar kind of shape, uh, deleveraging post the global financial crisis, uh, and then a general buildup of, of debt. Uh, in South Africa now, we're actually at the highest level we've been uh, since 2003. So there's quite a lot of leverage in the South African system, maybe a bit less than the U.S., but bear in mind that interest rates in South Africa are higher than the U.S. So the impact of leverage on the income statement in South Africa is more severe than uh, in the U.S. because we're carrying a fair amount of debt, but our interest rates will be sort of 500 basis points higher than a normal uh, a U.S. corporate. Okay, why do companies take on debt? I mean, you or I would effectively go to the bank for money because we didn't have sufficient money to buy an asset. So we want to buy a house for two million. We only have a million rand of equity uh, and we need the bank to effectively put up the, the balance. Uh, similar thing for companies as well. They, they, they need the capital. Uh, but the big thing for companies is that the cost of debt is typically much cheaper when things are going well than the cost of equity. So you can think of the cost of equity as the return that a shareholder like myself might require to invest in a company. Uh, and in this sort of simplistic example, I've taken that to be 10%, uh, whereas the cost of debt for this particular company, uh, which I've called ABC, might be 5%. So let's start our story in 2008. Let's say ABC wants to buy a business in the US. Uh, let's say that business trades on a P multiple of 12. Uh, if we invert 12, we get the earnings yield. That's roughly about 8 uh, it wouldn't make sense for a company with a cost of capital of 10% to buy an asset only yielding 8%. Uh, so effectively what this company does, it takes on some leverage. So it gears up its balance sheet at a 30% net debt to capital, uh, and it lowers its cost of funds. The cost of funds is really just the weighted average of the company's cost of capital and the uh, company's cost of debt. So the company now has a uh, a cost of debt of, call it, 8.5%, it now sort of makes sense for them to buy an asset that's going to yield 8. So effectively, they uh, acquire uh, this business. Fast forward four years, they come across an acquisition in Latin America. Latin America has got quite a lot of growth, so this particular acquisition that they're looking at maybe is on a P of 15 times. Uh, if we invert 15, we get an earnings yield of 6. So if they buy this Latin American company in the first year, they get to earn a 6% return. Again, it doesn't help them because they've got a cost of capital of, of eight. Uh, so what do they do? They effectively take on more debt. Now we're running at 50% net debt to capital. Obviously, interest rates now in 2012 are effectively at historic lows, so it's encouraging these companies to take on more debt. Uh, they lower their cost of capital uh, and effectively consummate the acquisition. Now you can see how this sort of buildup of debt can quickly get out of hand if a number of companies are all doing similar kind of things, chasing a limited number of acquisitions and trying to fund it with cheap debt. Uh, and that's effectively what happened in, in, this, company's uh, in this example. Um, another acquisition in 2016, the company is now ru running 
uh, debt levels very similar to a private equity type structure, 70% net debt to net debt to capital. Uh, as Mark Twain famously said, uh, too much of a good thing is bad, unless it's, unless it's obviously good whiskey, in which case too much is hardly enough. Um, but in this particular company's case, too much debt uh, did actually end quite, quite badly. ABC is actually, with a bit of poetic license, ABI or AB InBev, uh, the company which bought Budweiser, Grupo Modelo, uh, and then finally in uh, 2016 acquired SAB Miller for sort of 23 times uh, PE multiple. You can see the market being highly rewarded of a company that is able to use cheap debt to do acquisitions. Until we get to 2018, the economy starts to weaken, the market then begins to concern itself with maybe companies that have taken on too much debt and can't repay it. So in 2018, you've got a company here with $130 billion of debt uh, and about a $200 billion, rand, uh, $200 billion uh, market cap. The market then realizes that, that, that this debt pile hasn't reduced at all in the two years since the SAB Miller acquisition. Uh, and that's because AB InBev at this point in time is paying out all of its dividends, or sorry, all of its free cash flow, its cash earnings is going all to the shareholders as, as a dividend. Uh, and now people worry about its ability to actually repay the debt, and then this is the debt maturity profile. So now there's a large amount of its debt is due in the next three or four years. You can sort of see here they need to repay $60 billion, almost half their debt pile, in the next sort of four years. And the market sort of worries about, well, how are they going to do that if all of their cash earnings are going to the shareholders as a dividend? So that begins to weigh on the ABI InBev share price. What do management do? They basically halve the dividend. Massive negative impact on the share price. In fact, ABI's... Uh, dollar market cap fell by 35% uh, in the second half of, of 2018. But effectively, management were forced to do that to effectively delever the balance sheet. So now they're only taking half their free cash flow and giving it to the shareholders. The other half now is going to the banks, and effectively, they are delevering the balance sheet. Uh, they're also able to sort of push out some of their maturity, so they buy back some of their earlier debt, and they issue debt at the longer end. Uh, to give both the banks and the equity holders comfort that they can now actually finance this debt repayment schedule. So it was, I guess, the correct move by AB InBev, but had disastrous implications for shareholders who effectively thought the company was trading on an 8% dividend yield and then woke up the next day to realize that the dividend yield was sort of only 4%. So debt effectively has an indirect loop back into equity valuations uh, if it's going to impact the cash flow coming to the shareholders. So as I mentioned, 2018 was a difficult year and sort of figur figuratively the, the tide went out. Operating conditions became more difficult. Uh, although today in June 19, we're talking about interest rate cuts from the Fed, all we saw in 2018 was the US Fed raising rates and more and more talk about rates rising. So the market began to worry about those companies that had taken on a lot more debt. Okay, who had been swimming naked? I guess to sort of answer that question, we sort of show you this chart. Uh, total return of companies between November 17 and April 19 uh, on the vertical axis and then on the horizontal axis, net debt to capital. So the average South African company sits around here, sort of 40% net debt to capital, as I mentioned, ESCOM uh, sitting out here. Okay, why do we use November 17 as a starting point? Uh, effectively, at that point, the market was misguided in believing that Steinhoff 6.5 billion euros of debt, also, also taken on to finance numerous acquisitions, was backed by 23 billion euros of capital. So at that point, the market thought that actually Steinhoff's leverage sat here. Obviously, we now know that in the morning of the 6th of December uh, 2017, we got the announcement from the board that they were questioning the recoverability and the validity of 6 billion euros of assets. Obviously, the share price took a significant uh, whopping, uh, it's down sort of 95% since that period of time. Not only was the market concerned that you've lost potentially 6 billion euros of assets, but the market realizes that the capital structure is no longer sustainable. That 6 billion euros of debt is not going to be uh, sustainable given the new level of assets or capital uh, that you're running in, in the business. So you know, we estimate using the FY17 numbers of Steinhoff, uh, we're still awaiting the FY18 published results, uh, that that sort of net debt to capital of this business is sort of 85%, which leads you to conclude that the equity is, is very close to worthless, 
and ultimately the banks will, will take over this, this company uh, in, 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 in all probability. Okay, they weren't the only company, though. These are just sort of examples in our view of uh, situations where the market effectively you know, penalized these companies. I mean, these companies were down anywhere from sort of 30% to sort of 70%, uh, and one of the key features here was simply too much debt. So you can see a number of the property stocks there, uh, AB InBev, which we talked about, uh, and then also Aspen and British American Tobacco. Um, I talk about Aspen and British American Tobacco because this time last year we actually owned both of those stocks. Uh, they endured quite a difficult second half. Aspen was down 45, British American Tobacco uh, was down 35. Uh, but uh, at about this time last year we actually decided to sell the Aspen and buy more British American Tobacco. Okay, why do you ask maybe? Uh, the, the, leverage, the, leverage sim, the leverage sort of seems similar in, in both those cases. Why buy one and sort of sell the other? And I guess it all comes down to sort of free cash flow. The only thing that can delever a balance sheet in the absence of a rights issue or an asset sale is free cash flow. So what portion of the company's reported earnings are physical cash that they can give to uh, the banks to effectively delever the balance sheet? So this is an analysis we ran in the second half of 2018 looking at the free cash flow forecasts of these two companies. Uh, at the moment, I haven't told you which, which company is which, but the free cash flow forecast looks sort of reasonable at this point in time. Uh, you wouldn't think any company necessarily has, has, a, has a problem. Uh, although at Prudential, we often talk about the folly of forecasting. Be careful of sort of market forecasts. The future is, is highly uncertain. So we also spend a lot of time looking at the actual history, what has transpired in the past, and whether that's a good guide uh, to the future. Uh, and what you'll see, or what we at least saw, was we thought that this company had a much higher cash flow profile than this one here, which seemed quite irregular. Uh, in fact, on average, uh, the one company had a sort of a free cash flow yield of 10%. So 10% of their market cap comes back to you every year as cash, uh, whereas the other company was sort of only 2%. Okay, so no sort of no guesses. Obviously, we bought more of the 10%, the, African, uh, the, uh, the British American tobacco, and sold uh, the 2%. Okay, a bit more detail into British American Tobacco's free cash flow. So this is the actual free cash flow of the company and what the company does with the free cash flow. So it's also important to understand not just how much cash the company has, but what historically they've done with the cash. So the shaded bars is a transfer of cash to the shareholders by dividends, share buybacks, or indirectly by paying down debt. So you can see on most of these years, uh, British American Tobacco gives its cash back to its shareholders either directly or indirectly, uh, and therefore the forecast that that will happen in the future seemed reasonable to us. Okay, but if you look at Aspen, here you effectively have uh, solid bars below the line. So that effectively is shareholders putting money into the company, either via rights issues or effectively increasing debt. Uh, and here the future effectively, or the forecasts from the market, seem quite inconsistent uh, with the past. Uh, the market here sort of assumes that Aspen will stop doing acquisitions, uh, whereas we look at the stripe bars, there's effectively 13 stripe bars in this 15-year history. The company always does acquisitions. So the market's conjecture uh, that they're going to stop doing acquisitions and, and give the, back, the money back to the banks in terms of uh, deleveraging to us seemed uh, highly unlikely. Uh, the other issues we had with, with Aspen was that sort of their entire debt pile, sort of 55 billion rands worth, uh, is due in the next sort of three years. So they have a very steep uh, repayment profile, um, and therefore, the, the, in our view, they're going to be forced to try, and there's a risk that they're not going to be able to sort of refinance that. A lot of this debt that they have, the 55 billion rand, is actually denominated in euros. So the other concern is they're able to refinance, but the banks force them to refinance in rands, and that's going to hurt the income statement because euro borrowing rates are around 2%. If they're forced to refinance at 9%, that's going to have a huge impact on their, um, on their income statement. We also had some concerns about how much of Aspen's earnings actually got, get converted into true cash, uh, and that has played out in the current year. So Aspen's forecast, as we've moved through 2019, have been brought down by the market, the stock is down now another 30% uh, in the first half of 2019, whereas with British American Tobacco, the forecasts have remained unchanged. 
there was some concern in November. Um, uh, British American Tobacco fell 25% in, in the month of November last year. That They, too, would cut their dividend as AB InBev did. In fact, if anything, in February, we saw a, uh, British American Tobacco actually increase their dividend. So we remain comfortable with that uh, as a holding. Okay, this is the Prudential Equity Fund, a similar kind of scatter plot, total return, uh, and net debt to capital. These are all our holdings as at the end of April. Uh, you can see here, we don't necessarily shun debt. We hold stocks that are highly levered, and we hold stocks uh, that are um, uh, in a net cash position. So this is Naspas uh, following their partial stake of $0.10, cents, sitting on a lot of cash. And then this down here is Richmond, uh, run by the Ruperts. They run a very conservative uh, sort of balance sheet. Um, just a quick comment on, on the colors. Uh, red is a company that has taken on more debt in the last 18 months, whereas gray is a company that effectively is paying back the debt. Uh, obviously, we have a preference for companies that are deleveraging. Uh, and you can actually see things like Anglo American, Ultron, uh, which are actually stocks that were quite highly levered but are able to delever themselves, can have very high sort of returns. Um, and I'll sort of quickly run you through the, the Ultron story. So, Ultron is a sort of family run business, uh, historically run by a, company, a family called the Fenters. Uh, they were quite exposed to the public sector and particularly ESCOM. Obviously, as ESCOM went through their problems, um, one of their businesses called Powertech effectively started to generate losses. Uh, and you can see the impact that that had on the share price. Uh, at the same time, the company was very sort of conservatively managed, being a family-owned company. Uh, but then they did some debt-funded acquisitions, so a build-up of debt here. Um, and then uh, this is the net debt to capital. So you can see, see net debt to capital going from zero up to that sort of uncomfortable 60% level which tends to worry shareholders. In fact, at one point, the debt was larger than uh, the market cap. Okay, what do we see in Ultron that made us buy the stock? Again, it came down to free cash flow. Uh, the business was selling a large, oh, a number of their operating entities, including things like Autopage uh, and their ESCOM-facing business. Uh, and our view was that those sales would be successful uh, and the capital would come back to the company and the company would use that to deliver. Uh, so you can see here, in 2016, the company generated 2 billion rand of cash in that year. Their market cap in that year was 2 billion rand. So you effectively got the entire market cap of the company returned to you in that one year. The company used that to delever the balance sheet. So you can see the debt reducing. Debt to capital comes down. The market stops panicking about debt. Uh, and effectively, the share price uh, then triples from, from that point in time. So companies that are highly levered but can delever themselves can, offer, can often give you very high returns, which obviously is what we're hoping for the unnamed stock over here, which is levered as high as, as ESCOM. Uh, we often talk about quality, so we, we, you know, we talk about trying to uh, construct a portfolio of higher quality stocks. Unlike our peers, we don't regard quality be, to be quality of management. We would rather look at things like the, the quality of the actual assets and then the quality of the balance sheet. So you know, how levered is a balance sheet, irrespective of what we may or may not think of, of management. So here's just some uh, quality metrics for our fund versus the benchmark. So these are things that we continue to look at. How geared is our portfolio relative to the market? And then also what is the free cash flow yield of, of our portfolio uh, relative to the market? Uh, and this mantra has held, has, has held us in very good stead. Uh, you can see here, although the market has been sort of quite poor uh, in the last three years, we have generated sort of reasonably good, in fact, exceptional alpha over those last uh, sort of three years. Yeah. And then our concluding slide uh, is just looking at the longer-term performance of our equity funds. So in red, uh, the Prudential Equity Fund, uh, and then in grey, the Prudential Dividend Maximizer relative to their benchmarks. They have had quite a good uh, a period of performance. Uh, yeah, that's it from me. So we'll be happy to take questions at the end, and then I'll hand over now to uh, Peter Hugo. Thanks so much.